Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Any in today, and uh, we just praise the Lord. I was just reminding our studio audience, for those of you out in television, when we started, which was really 14 years ago this month, we decided this morning we taped our very first program. 14 years, doesn't seem possible, but we had probably 15 people. And uh, then for the long time, if we'd get to 20, my, we thought we had it made. And uh, so over the years, it's just gradually been growing. So again, I want to thank all of you in the studio audience for putting forth the effort. I know a lot of you have driven a long way. We got folks here from Oklahoma City. We got folks here from Colorado, Missouri, Illinois, uh, Arkansas, and of course, Oklahoma. So uh, for those of you out on television, uh, if you're ever in uh, the Tulsa area, we try to tape the first Wednesday of the month and uh, check in with us and come in and be a part of the studio audience. It's, uh, it's a fun afternoon, it really is. We have a lot of time of fellowship, and uh, again, I guess I should mention, it's been a long time since I've done this, we tape four program in succession, so those of you who catch the weekly program, I'll be wearing the same shirt, four <laughs> programs in a row. And uh, once in a while we'll get a letter, do you only have one shirt? Well, <laughs> I can understand why uh, some people may think that, but uh, anyway. We're uh, glad you're here, and uh, after the first program, we stop and have a coffee break, and uh, that's the way we go through the afternoon. For those of you, again, out in television, we just want to thank you with all that's in us for all of your financial help, for your prayers, and my, how we enjoy your letters, especially the short ones. We, we appreciate the fact that most of you know that if we're going to read every letter, it, uh, it, has to be, uh, it has to be short, or we'd never get through them all. But... Uh, Anyway, I don't need it, Gary. <laughs> I don't need it. It was just something extra. Okay, now let's get back where we're going to start. Isaiah 54, verse 1. Now again, for those of you who may be new to the program, uh, we like to kind of repeat and repeat and repeat for your benefit. And remember now that Isaiah is writing 700 years before Christ, and yet in some of these things he writes as though it's almost a past tense. That is how unique prophecy is in our Bible. And again, I keep repeating this. There is no other book on earth that can do that. Only our Bible, the Word of God, can tell things hundreds and hundreds of years as if it's past. And uh, never forget that. Whenever they try to lift up some other religion and their writer and their book and their God, they cannot hold a candle to this book because they cannot tell one event in the future. You know, even your most famous fortune tellers like Gene Dixon here a few years ago, you know what their batting average is at the very best? 50%. And that's all they are, 50% guesses. But this book is right 100% and it's written many times thousands of years in advance. And we're going to see some of that even in our first half hour this afternoon. So again, uh, we always want to remember that this is written 700. The nation of Israel has just recently been divided, the northern kingdom with 10 tribes, the southern kingdom with two, but yet Isaiah living in the southern kingdom will address both the northern and the southern kingdom. And of course, at 700 B.C., that is around 100 years before Nebuchadnezzar will come in and destroy the city and the temple and take Israel captive. And again, it's written as though it's just right out in front of them. Now, as I was driving up yet today, I was just mulling over how, how often we forget the vast amount of time that elapses up through the Old Testament. In other words, from, from Moses until King David was almost 500 years. Then from King David until Isaiah starts writing about the coming judgments and everything, is another 300 years. Not three years, not 30 years, 300. Now think about that. That's a long time. Why, well, we've only been a nation less than that. And so all these events that are uh, unfolding throughout our Old Testament is not just within a short period of time, it's over hundreds and hundreds of years. We, God's wheels grind slowly and surely, see? Okay, so now then, 
after last week's prophecy concerning Christ's crucifixion, graphic description of his suffering, his death. Now in chapter 44, we come into the glorious promises that will follow Israel. First, of course, after they've come back from the Babylonian captivity and they reestablish temple worship. But the big picture, remember, is what we're always looking at, is after the horrors of the seven years of tribulation, Christ will return and Israel is going to have all these Old Testament promises fulfilled. And this is what we're going to look at right here. Okay, verse 1. Sing, O barren. Well, what does singing remind you of? Well, good feeling, joy, and happiness, see? So sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and crying loud, thou didst not travail with child. Now, more than likely, what Isaiah is referring to are those years when Israel was spiritually dead. And there were hundreds of years of those where Israel was just steeped in their unbelief and their rebellion, and consequently there was no joy of an increase in blessings or anything else. And so now, with the hope of this coming kingdom, they can sing and like one who has travailed, and then verse 1 reading on, For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. All right, that's kind of a tough one to explain, so I'm going to pass over that. Come down to verse 2. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Well, what does that speak of? Well, progressive growth. Uh, when you enlarge the tent, it just simply means you're getting ready for more occupants. And that's what Israel is to do. They're to get ready now for a great expansion of their blessings. All right, stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation, spare not, lengthen thy cords. In other words, remember, we're speaking of a tent back in antiquity, and uh, the tent pegs would be stretched out further away to make room for a larger tent, just a symbolic picture of how the nation will be increasing in blessings. Now verse 3, For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. Blessings upon blessings are waiting for the nation of Israel. And thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. Now you've got to remember, ever since especially the Babylonian uh, invasion and destruction of the city, according to Scripture, from that point on, Israel has been under the heavy boot of the Gentile Empire. They have never enjoyed national blessings as a separate entity. But the day is coming when they will. And not only will they enjoy the blessings, but they're going to su uh, be supreme over all the Gentile nations. And we're going to look at a few of those in just a moment. All right, verse 3, reading on, that they shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. In other words, there's going to be a great growth of Israel's population, their, their everything. Now let's just go back and look at a few of those promises that are uh, sprinkled throughout the Old Testament looking forward to this day when Israel will finally cash in on all of these blessings of the promises. Let's go all the way back, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, and we'll get a glimpse of the blessings that are awaiting the nation of Israel. They have never enjoyed this in their history. Not even close. But the day is coming when they will. Now they had it as a prospect all through their history, but because of their unbelief and their belligerence and their wickedness, their lifestyle of sin, they never, they never experienced it. All right, but Deuteronomy 28, and uh, let's just drop all the way up to... Uh, Verse 9, honey. Deuteronomy 28, let's just jump in at verse 9. Now these are all promises that God has made to the nation of Israel. The Lord, you all got it? I don't want to go too quick because that's one complaint I get. I don't wait long enough. Deuteronomy 28, verse 9. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself as he hath sworn unto thee if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. In other words, God demands obedience. All right, now read on. 
all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. The Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods. They're going to be productive beyond our imagination. You'll be plenteous in goods in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy ground, in the land, the land of promise now, in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give thee. Now verse 12, the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give rain to the land in his season, to bless all the work of thy hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations. What's Israel's financial situation today? They have to borrow constantly. They couldn't survive. All right? But now it's going to be reversed. Israel will be in a position to lend to other nations. See? All right? And thou shalt lend to many nations. Thou shalt not borrow. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto the land in his season, to bless all the work. And thou shalt lend. I'm sorry, I'm repeating it. Verse 13. And the Lord shall make thee the what? The head. See, they're going to be the top nation of the nations when Christ returns and sets up this kingdom. All right, thou shalt be the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if you hearken unto the commands of the Lord, which I command thee this day. Well, that's one of the very earliest, long before they even actually got into the land of promise. But all the way up through the Old Testament, you have these promises of how Israel will one day enjoy the blessings. Now, let's see. Let's go to Zechariah. Zechariah, that's the next to last book in your Old Testament. And we'll be running across some others before we leave Isaiah in the next few programs. But as you get to Zechariah, chapter 8, we'll begin at verse 20. And we've used these verses, especially in our classes and seminars, but I don't think I've used them that much on the program. Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 20. Now remember, these are all Old Testament prophecies and promises. None of these have been fulfilled as yet, but they will. Now I guess this is a good time as any to stop. You know, there are those who oppose my line of teaching by saying that God's all through with the Jew. That when Titus destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D., that was the end of all these promises. That Israel disappeared, they faded away as a nation of people, and all the promises have been turned over to the church. Uh, some people call it replacement theology. I call it plain old all millennialism. Now there's another new name for it, and it's preterism. Well, if they claim that there's nothing more to be fulfilled after 70 A.D., then all these promises have failed? Then our God has failed? I might as well throw the book away and go home. But they haven't. They're still going to be fulfilled. Our God is still in control. Those people in the Middle East are Jews. They try to re reject that fact. But they're Jews. They're Israel. In fact, I just had a call, I think, early this morning or late last night. Maybe it was late last night. But somebody called, and uh, about all the tribes of Israel. I said, well, you've got to remember that they never were lost. They all went into the Babylonian captivity. They all came back under Ezra and Nehemiah. And then I took him to the verse where Peter says in Acts 2.36, Therefore, let the whole house of Israel know assuredly. So what that tell you? Even in Peter's day, that Pentecostal crowd included Jews of every tribe. None of them were ever lost. And so the same way when the 144,000 will be chosen out of Israel at the very beginning of the tribulation. They're all there. They're all going to be able to provide 12,000 young men to fulfill the 144,000. They're not lost. God knows who they are. All right, so here we have it again. This prophecy has not yet been fulfilled, but it will be. Verse 20, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass. Is God lying? No, he's not lying. Is he incapable of fulfilling it? 
No, he's not incapable. He is fully capable, and he will. All right, and it shall come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts, and I'll go also. Yea, many people and strong nations. See, that's the Gentile world. These strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts. Where? In Jerusalem. That'll be the, nation, the world's capital. And to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days when Israel has her king, it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations. They'll take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you. Why? We have heard that God is with you. Why? Because of all these promises. See? All right, let's go into the New Testament. Let's go into uh, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we'll drop in at uh, verse 64, honey. Luke chapter 1, we'll jump in at 64. While you're looking for it, I'll give you the background. You remember that uh, one of the priests of Israel was a man by the name of Zacharias, and his wife's name was Elizabeth. And Zacharias and Elizabeth supernaturally had a child whose name was John the Baptist. All right, all during Elizabeth's gestation of nine months, Zacharias was stricken speechless. He could not talk. And everybody in Israel practically knew it. But when the child was born and they asked Elizabeth what the name would be, she said John. Well, they were all shook up because no Jew had ever been called John. So they trot up to the temple and they find Zechariah and they write on a tablet that the baby has been born and what's to be his name? And he took the pen and he wrote John. And as soon as he wrote John, he got his voice back. Well, then everybody was all alarmed. What in the world's going on? All right, now let's pick it up then in verse 64. His mouth was opened, and immediately his tongue loosed, and he spoke and praised God. Fear came on all that dwelt round about, and all these sayings were noised abroad throughout the hill country of Judea. Well, like what? This elderly couple, she conceived. And the minute she conceived, he lost his voice. And he's been absolutely what we call dumb now for nine months. But as soon as the baby was born, he's got his voice back. What's going on? See? All right, here we go. Verse 67. And, uh, no, verse 66. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? Now remember, we're not talking about Jesus. We're talking about John the Baptist. And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zacharias, the priest, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is long before Pentecost. And yet he's filled with the Holy Spirit, which means that everything he says is directed from God himself. This isn't wishful Jewish thinking. This is God speaking through this Spirit-filled priest. All right? Now, this is what he says. And remember now what we've just read in the Old Testament. And his father, Zacharias, was filled, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he, the Lord, has visited and redeemed his people. And he hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now, as we read this, be careful to watch. Is there any reference to Gentiles? Not a word. This is all dealing with the promises made to Israel. And none of these promises apply to the Gentiles except as they come through Israel. So these promises here are to the nation. All right? He has redeemed his people. Verse 69, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us, the nation of Israel, in the house of his servant David. No Gentiles in the house of David. Verse 70, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the ages began. Now watch the language. That we should be saved from our, not sins, what? Enemies. All right, now stop and think. Who were Israel's enemies from day one? Well, the Arab world. 
You know, I always have a good time going back into Nehemiah in my classes, especially here in Oklahoma. And I show how that even in the day of Nehemiah, when they were trying to rebuild the city wall and the city gate, who was constantly opposing? The Arabs. The Arabs. And it got to the place where if the Jews wanted to work, they had to work with a trowel in one hand and a weapon in the other, or they couldn't get anything done. So it's always been this way. But you can just fast forward up to 2004, it's still the same, all right? And all these promises are still valid that the day will come when Israel won't have to worry about the Arab world. Israel won't have to worry about Nazis or communists or anybody else. They're going to be under the protective care of their Messiah King. All right, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. What covenant? the one that he swore to our father Abraham. Now you got to remember, I'm going to cover the covenants when we finish Isaiah, that in that Abrahamic covenant, Abraham was promised a nation of people, totally different from anybody else. That reminded me of something else I thought of on the way up. You know, I read a long time ago, God made the nation of Israel different. And they have been. They are. But what was the eternal purpose in it? To prove that nobody in the human race is any different from the other. So Israel was shown to be different to prove they're no different. Now, did I make my point? The whole Adamic race, whether it's Jew or Gentile, they're still sons of Adam. All right, now let's go back again. The Abrahamic covenant promised that out of Abraham and Sarah would come this special nation of people. And why would it be special? Because out of Israel would come first the Word of God, out of Israel would come the Messiah, and out of Israel would come all the prophetic promises. You know, and you've heard me say it over and over, Israel is the hub of God's wheel. And you pull Israel out, you destroy the nation of Israel, God's program falls apart. And again, you could throw the book away. But Israel will never, never leave. Okay, let's go a couple more verses here, and then our time's about gone already. And so the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us, the nation, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, see that? How they're finally going to have all the promises fulfilled, and they're going to be able to serve their Lord without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life, which will, of course, go on into eternity now, actually. And then he goes on to show the promises made to the man John the Baptist. But anyway, all the way through, and if we had the time, we could go all the way back to the last chapters of Revelation, when the glories of that kingdom on earth will be fulfilled on behalf of the nation of Israel. All right, for the next couple minutes, let's go back again to Isaiah chapter 54. Verse 3, remembering, For thou shalt break forth on the right and on the left thy seed. In other words, the coming generations shall inherit the Gentiles, and they'll make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not. Now you've got to remember, before all this could come to pass, Israel is going to go through 3,000 years of suffering and turmoil. 3,000 years. Now remember that when we come into the next program, next half hour, and I'll go to I'm going to show you how God compares it in his line of thinking. All right, but let's move on. Thou shalt um, not be ashamed, neither confounded, verse 4. Thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth. That is, as a nation, they'll forget all the trials and tribulation that the nation of Israel has gone through over these hundreds and hundreds of years. And thou shalt not remember the approach of thy widowhood anymore when God left the nation to their own devices and he said, you're no longer my people. And that's been over a good portion of their of their national lifetime. All right, verse 5, For thy maker, the creator, is thine husband. Now here we have that husband and wife relationship, especially as Hosea points it out. 
and maybe someday we'll teach Jose on the air. I've been thinking about it. But here we have that beautiful picture in that little six or seven chapters in the book of Hosea, how that Israel is the adulterous wife of Jehovah. Now, why do I call her adulterous? Because she ran after other gods. Just like an unfaithful woman will chase after men that are not her husband, so Israel chased after other lovers, nationally speaking, in the realm of the spiritual. And so she's called the unfaithful wife of Jehovah. But one day, Jehovah will forgive her of all her sin, and she will come in and be that blessed wife of the husband. All right, verse 5 again. For thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. That's Jehovah. And thy redeemer, the one who will satisfy all their sin. Thy Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, their Messiah. See? The God of the whole earth shall he be called. Now there again, that puts all other gods and goddesses and religions, whatever you want to call them, it just puts them down into the realm of nothingness because only the God of Israel is the God of creation and the God of this book. All right, verse 6. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth. And that marriage has been dissipated by unfaithfulness because of Israel's chasing after other gods. All right, a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God, for a small, now watch it, here's what I was coming to. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, and what's he calling the force a small moment? 3,000 years. Isn't that something? And yet that's the eternalness of our God. 3,000 years are but a moment in his line of thinking. And, uh, you know, it's so hard for us mortals to comprehend that. See, that's why, along with my enthusiasm for the soon return, as we seal the world seemingly getting so ready, for, for Christ to enter back into human history. And yet I have to always temper that with this very thing, that with God, time means nothing. Ten years isn't even a split second in his line of thinking. So, yes, I think the Lord could be coming in the next few years, but God may think otherwise. And so we cannot just give up and say, oh, well, I'm not going to plant a tree because after all, the Lord's coming. He may not be. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.